today we're going to be talking about Jonah chapter 2 and uh, talking about running to God. Last week, just a quick review, God will ask us to do things, number one, that we don't want to do, but we need to trust that he knows best. Number two, some people kind of, after church, they kind of question me about this, but here it is, number two, delayed obedience is disobedience. Now, I want to just clarify that for one moment. It's, it's amazing what God will do for us even when we're disobedient. In his grace, he seems to still help us and to move things along. And the reason why delayed obedience is so tricky is that there's always a boat willing to take us to Tarshish. We've got to be careful. Number three, be like Jonah and take responsibility. And that's really hard. When you did something wrong and you want to be right, but you're not, you've got to learn to take responsibility. I have to learn to take responsibility. Number four, sometimes fish and storms are what saves us. Jonah was headed in the wrong direction and God sent a fish to get his attention. And sometimes difficult times can be just that, God trying to get our attention. Jonah chapter 2 is this beautiful Hebrew prayer that's often referred to the psalm of Jonah. Because there's all these direct quotes in it from the psalms. He says this, I cried out to you in distress, Psalm 18, 120. Waves and breakers came over my head, Psalm 132. I was deep in the realm of the dead, Psalm 120. Up from the pit you brought me, Psalm 30. Salvation comes from the Lord, Psalm I mean, I think that we can admit that Jonah knew the word. And it says this in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. I mean, this seems to be where God finally got Jonah's attention. Have you ever been going through a bunch of things, and then some, God finally gets your attention? He said, Oh yeah, God, that was you all along. Well, this is Jonah. He's going through all these things, and then all of a sudden, God finally has Jonah's attention, and he says this, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Have you ever been in distress or in a hard time? It says, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Circle these two words in your Bible. Distress and answered. When Jonah was in distress, when he was going through this difficulty, the, lo the Lord answered him. I think we need to just grasp that in our hearts today. If you don't grasp anything else that I say, remember this. When he called out to God, God answered him. We have this ability to call out to the God of the universe, the creator, the sustainer, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We have this ability to call out to him and he will answer. What doesn't make sense to me is this. Jonah called out to God right after he basically said, God, forget about you. I mean, how many times have we done that with our actions? God, forget about you. We don't say it out loud because that sounds bad, but we do it with our actions. Forget about you. And God still in his mercy answered him. Don't let that pass you by today. He said, no, God, I'm not doing that. But when he called out, God still answered him. Number one, when we call on God, he will answer when we call on God, He will answer. Now we need to understand that sometimes that answer might not be what we like. Or it might not be in the timing we like. But God wants to answer us. It's so amazing to me that often we say, I've done everything that I can. All I can do now is pray. Why is prayer our last resort? Shouldn't it be our first thing we do when things get tough? Prayer shouldn't be our last effort, especially when we read Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach the God's throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In our time of need, God tells us that we have the ability to approach Him, His throne, with confidence. How many have ever had did something wrong in your life? Junior? Okay, uh, so we, we've all been there. But often we we often we we think that how our earthly parents are going to respond is how God is going to respond. But we can pray with confidence that we need to be people who pray first. But instead we say things well like, I, I'm thinking about you. <coughs> or thoughts and prayers. But we actually don't pray. I think that we need to make a decision today that we are going to be people who pray first. How many have ever said to someone, hey, I'll, I'll pray for you, and then forgot about it and didn't pray for them? Here's an idea. Why not stop and pray right then? Right then. We need to be people who pray. This church needs to be a church that prays. Why? Because in our distress, he will answer. The word distress is T S A R A H to Sarah. And jo this is the word that Jonah uses, and it's this beautiful word. It means the travail of childbirth. Now, Jonah's a man, he's never given birth to a child. But that's how the word, the pain of childbirth. So, what he said is, in my distress, in the agony as if I was giving birth. I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. From the realm of the dead is Sheol, which means grave. The King James translate this as hell. In other words, he's saying this. In the point which I was farthest from God, to the place where I am miserable and I have no way to contribute. From the place where I am helpless, desperate, afraid, and hurting. From Sheol I called for help. It's amazing because most people, most people only call for help from God when things are really, really, really bad. I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, we don't do that, but if someone is, is far away from God, when things get really bad, when divorce is on the table, or financial ruin is on the table, or addiction is, is, is leading us down a road, or whatever is happening, we're like, you know what, I better call out on God. And that's kind of where he is today. This is an interesting quote. When I needed him the most, I deserved him the least. When I needed him the most, sometimes we deserve him the least. Jonah got himself into this mess. But God was there for him. He heard his cry. We look at Jonah 1 and 2 as a whole as they would look at it in the Hebrew language. It has this hint to salvation. Jonah was as good as dead. He was completely powerless and helpless. He was in the belly of the whale. He couldn't contribute a thing. But here's the truth. He wasn't hopeless because God is still, it was still on the throne. God heard his cry. And through his to Sarah, through his pain of giving birth, he caused him to rise from the dead so he could be born again. That's this underlying tone in this book. I mean, God could have done anything. Think about this. At this point in Jonah's story, God could have inter intervened in a different way. He could have just went, okay. And he could have changed the whole circumstances. Because God can do anything. He could have delivered him before he got to Joppa. He could have calmed the sea when the sailors prayed. He, when the sailors threw Jonah overboard, they could have thrown him a life ring. He could have floated to shore safely. 
God could have sent another ship to pick him up. Or he could have sent Flipper. Do you remember that show? <laughs> he could have sent Flipper. That's a show about dolphins. Or one dolphin and he used to save it. <laughs> he could have sent Flipper to save him and swim to shore. I mean, stranger things have happened. But God didn't do any of those things, but he still did a miracle. And all through this story, we see it as God is just actively working through Jonah's pain. God said, Jonah, go. He said, no. He jumped into a ship going 4,950 kilometers in the other direction. Phase one, God sent him a storm. It didn't work. Phase two, God sent a captain to tell him to pray. It didn't work. Phase three, the sailors had mercy on Jonah and didn't throw him overboard. It didn't work. Phase four, when they did throw him overboard, God sent a fish. I want you just to admire the scene for a moment. They threw a grown man overboard. And he was swallowed by a monster fish before their very eyes. Phase five, the fish kind of gets sick to his stomach and pukes him up on the shore. Any point in the story, we can point to this different place that God is working. But a lot of times in our own lives, we don't do that. We don't see that God is working in our heart. And we think that we're in this process of sanctification, which we talked about over the last few weeks. And we need to understand that God is working things out in us. But we don't see Him in the process. But instead we say, God, I want you to do this. And God doesn't do it, or doesn't do it in our time, and we freak out. We say, but God, I need this to happen. But there's something to learn in the process, number two. Don't overlook the little things. God's doing along your journey. We need to understand that sometimes we're in the process. And the process is about learning, about growing, about being more like Jesus. He may have you in a process that's ten phases long. And you've got to go through one to nine or we won't learn what he's trying to teach you before you get to ten so how many have ever been at step number four and quit? You're like, no, I'm not doing this. And then we never get to realize the freedom that is on the other side of the process. He wants us to learn. But what we need us to understand is often when we bail on the process, we're going to come back to the process again. But do you think you're going to start at four? You're going to have to go all the way to the beginning. I mean, we've been in Bucktush for 11 years. Last week was 11 years. And there was a process in my life to get here. The road to Bucktush had many phases. I mean, I was a son. I went to a youth group, Bible college. I worked at a campground after, as a, get this, I worked at a campground after Bible college as the maintenance person. If that is an imposter, I have never seen a greater imposter. Then I ended up in Bathurst and Listowel in Bucktush. And every step along the way of that process, there was a process for me. When I got to Bathurst, I was young and I thought I knew everything. And I thought that I was going to teach them what it was to be this and what it was to be that. But God showed me in those times, in the process, that I needed to love people above everything else. That people over paper. When I was in Listowel, it was a time for me. I learned so many things and was given so many opportunities. And I failed and I was picked up and I was given another chance. And I went through the process. 
I've been here for 11 years. And there was this process of mentorship and, and use, letting me use my gifts and moving along and being an associate. I mean, I could go on and on. But the truth is, I'm probably on process step number 8,432 of the process. We all have a lifetime to go. But God sees us through these phases to lead us, to teach us, to redirect us, to guide us, to heal us, to correct us, to shape us, to convict us, to sanctify us, until He leads us to His ultimate will. I would encourage you this morning, celebrate the place you're in. Because He's helping you in the process. What you learn today, you will need tomorrow. And what you learn tomorrow, you will need next week. And God has you in the process. <laughs> then it says this in verse 3. You hurl me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea. I mean, technically it was the sailors that did this. But Jonah really wisely recognized the hand of God behind it. Continuing in 3. And the currents swirled around me. All the waves and the breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me and deepened and deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me, beneath me barred me forever. He uses this word forever. I mean, was Jonah in the belly of the whale forever? No. He was there for three days. But this concept of forever in the ancient Hebrew world didn't exist. The word was olam. And it means the intensity of experience. That his experience in the whale, <laughs> if you can imagine, was very intense. Example. Why does watching Netflix, why does the time fly by so fast? How many of you ever watched Netflix so long that it says, click this button if you're still watching? Like they think you're dead, but you're not. You're, 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 you're still watching. So click this, and that's so embarrassing. It's like, oh, I should go for a walk or something. But you know, it's like, are you still alive? Push the button. But it's that intensity of experience. It's when you go on vacation, you say this, oh, did time ever fly? Why? Because it's this intensity of experience. Parents, the nights are long, but the days are short. Because it's this intensity of experience. That's the word olam, it's the intensity of experience. And it works that way, and it also works in the negative way. For example, school. Why does a six-hour school day feel like 16 hours? Because it's the intensity of the experience. On Monday, I drove four boys to camp. We left here. We weren't even in Kokan. Are we there yet? <laughs> no, we're not there. Three minutes later. Are we there yet? <laughs> this is the longest day of my life. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, me too, brother, me too. And like, but it was this intensity of experience. They were so excited. Example, boring preaching. No you know, it can feel like forever. Or if you're at your mall and your wife says, only five more minutes. <laughs> it's this intensity of experience. That wasn't right, eh? I, it, it's the intensity of experience. It, it, it seems longer or shorter than what we anticipate it to be. And that's what he's saying. He said, this was so intense. If you read through Jonah chapter 1 over and over, we see the word down. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship and laid down. The captain went down after him. The sailors asked Jonah, what to do for the sea to calm down. The sailors threw him into the sea and he sank down beneath the waves. Jonah went down into the belly of the fish. In this 
story is just this, in chapter 1, it's just this concept. He's going down and down. And, down. and then all of a sudden in chapter 2, he has this interaction with God and things start to change. Things start to go from being down and the language changed to being up. But you, O oh Lord, brought my life up from the pit. How many of us have been there? Life is just going down. And all of a sudden you have an encounter with the living God and things start to change. There might be a process. I've heard many people's stories in this room. You feel like your life was going down. But when you think about the moments that you encountered the presence of the living God, I've heard people say, my life is out of control, but God intervened. My marriage was in trouble, but God intervened. I had no money for that bill, but God came through. The doctor said there was no chance to make preparation, but God. My friends, I don't see my friends ever getting saved or my neighbors ever getting saved, but somehow God comes through. I would encourage you today, no matter how discouraged you may feel, do not forget about the but God moments. <coughs> Jonah was at this point where everything physical said, you'll never survive this. And then he called upon God and things started to change. He says this in verse 7, when my life was ebbing away, I remember you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. See, there was this finally started to act like the prophet that he was supposed to be, fulfilling this legacy of the son of truth. Reread the seriousness of his tone in the deepest point in his life. He's warning the readers Whatever you do, don't do what I do. Whatever you do, don't <coughs> run from God. I would be willing to bet that every single person has or is in some degree running from God. Whatever you do, the warning is, don't neglect or disobey Him. He says this in verse 8. Those who cling to worthless idols... <coughs> Turn away from God's mercy. Those who cling to the things that don't really matter, turn away from His mercy. The word mercies is said, H-E-S-E-D. And it's one of the hardest words in all of Scripture to translate. There's not a single word in the English language that does justice to the word said. Translators have used words like kindness, loving kindness, mercy, loyalty, sometimes even love. They say his said is one of the richest, most powerful words in the entire Old Testament. So whatever weak word we try to put in its place, it's not good enough. What's said, what we know is this, it's not to be taken as a feeling, it's to be taken as action. So we read it like this. The one who clings to idols of this world are unable to receive God's active has said, or his act of goodness, or his act of love, or his act of mercy. I mean, what were Jonah's idols? I mean, we don't really know, but we know a couple of things. He had an idol of prejudice. He didn't like the Ninevites, so he wasn't going to minister to them. Number two, he had an idol of self. He heard God, but he didn't care. And this is where things in verse 9 start to change. But I, with shouts of praise, grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I would vow, I will make good. What did he vow? We don't know. But judging by the situation, we can assume his vow was, if God speaks to me, I'll speak. If God tells me to go, I'll go. 
When we, we don't know for sure, but if we read all of Jonah, that's what he does. He disobeys and he doesn't go. And he says, no, no, I'm going to keep the vow that you've given to me. If you speak, I'll speak. If God tells me to go, I'll go. See, and this is where I want us to understand this morning. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. There was nothing he could do to contribute to his salvation or coming out of the fish. He couldn't sacrifice a goat. He couldn't give money to the temple. He couldn't do any kind of physical work. He couldn't feed the poor. There was nothing he could do to help himself get out of the fish. And that's the, what makes this last verse so amazing. In verse 9, second half. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. My salvation comes from the Lord alone. We need to understand that salvation is from God. It's not from us. It's not from works. It's not from doing good things. It's not doing good things repeatedly over a long period of time. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that anyone could boast. It's never been by our own works. It's a gift of God through His Son, Jesus. If we can recognize that in our hearts today, then that changes everything. That often we've been fighting over long periods of time to try to change things about us, but maybe we just have to give our lives to Him totally. Here's my life, God. Take it. And I mean, it's only after that Jonah figures this all out in verse 10, he says this, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. So Jonah goes through this whole process, all these phases, all the trial. He goes through everything. And after Jonah's like, okay, my salvation comes from you. I need you. I won't have my own idols. I'll do what you want. God says, okay, fish. Puke them up. I mean, it's kind of disgusting. But it drives home this thought that I hope echoes in your heart. Number three. Whether you're up or down, when we call on the Lord, He will answer. I mean, this is how nice God is. In the book of Jonah, God listens and responds to this desperate city of desperate people who are full of desperate circumstances of their own creation. They got themselves into this mess on their own. This is something that we often miss about God. We think, oh, God in the Old Testament, he was just a grumpy old man. He was in constant pursuit of his people. This is often we miss out. We think that there's no way he could come back given how we've treated him and treated ourselves. But in the book of Jonah and the rest of the Bible, there's this, this invitation always. Come back. Return. Repent. It's not too late. Jonah chapter 1 is about Jonah running from God. In chapter 2, Jonah's running to God because God has done enough to get his attention. He's pursued him onto a boat, into the water, into a fish. And he said, I want you. This morning, it's about salvation. I need you to know in closing that you can't save yourself. Not actual closing, just this part. This morning, it's salvation. You can't save yourself. You could give every penny that you own today you can serve every stray or every stray animal. You could feed every starving child in the world. It is not enough. Every single person in this room deserves hell. But God is so gracious and so kind that He is always pursuing you. <coughs> and even if you got yourself, even if I got myself into the mess, He's still pursuing me. He'll still send a fish because he loves me that much. What do you need for
from God today. Maybe you're here and you say, Troy, I have to be honest. I've never accepted Christ into my life. Ever. I never have. And I need a Savior. I'm in the fish. I can't have nothing to contribute to get out of the fish. I need a Savior. If you're here this morning, surrender your heart to God. Say, how do I do that? Recognize that you're a sinner. Repent of your sin. Every one of us has sinned. Remember that you need a Savior. Maybe you're here and your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe you're here and money has overtaken your life and you could lose everything. Maybe you're here and you feel like your faith has faltered. Or maybe you're here and you feel sick or you're sick in your body and you need a healing. You say, what's the answer? Be like Jonah. Surrender to him. <clears throat> Say, I might be in the pit. The waves might be overtaking me. But I need you. God, I need to reach out to you today. So what we're going to do over our next few moments of our service together. If you're here and you have never accepted Christ in your life, or you did at some point, but you have wandered away from Him, I hope you know today that God loves you, but there's nothing you can do to save yourself. You need a Savior. And he sent his only son to die on a cross for you. Because he loves you that much. That you could feed every starving children. It will never earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift by grace through faith. And if you are here this morning, and I know that you might say this feels awkward to me. But if you're here this morning and say, Troy, I need to accept God into my life. I just encourage everyone just to close your eyes. But if you're here and you say, Troy, I need God. I would encourage you to be brave and just stand right where you are. Don't be shy today. Don't be shy. you say, Troy, I, I, I'm in the whale. I have nothing to contribute. I need God. I need His goodness and His forgiveness. If that's you today, why don't you be brave enough just to stand to your feet? If you're here this morning and you have a circumstance that you need God. That you need to call out to Him. Why don't you stand? For whatever the reason it is. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you say, God, I need you today. A healing. If you are headed in a direction and God is trying to intervene with you, if you just need His presence or you feel dry, don't be shy this morning. If you need a healing in your body, if you need direction in your life, If you're just hoping for a miracle. If you need healing in a marriage or a relationship or a friendship. That we 
serve a God who raises these things from the dead. Dear God, I pray for every single person who's standing. That over the next few moments as we worship together, that we would reach out to you as Jonah did. That we say, even though the waves feel like they're overpowering me, I'm counting on you. Even though I feel like I'm in the belly of a fish and I have no way out, I'm counting on you. <laughs>